Hello and welcome back into End on a Make, where tonight I want to talk a little bit about the Sacramento Kings. Uh, first off, before jumping into all of that, shout out the Utah Jazz. 154 points is the most points in franchise history. Eight players in double figures. 24 threes for the team on the night. And it, th they beat the Kings by 49 points without Donovan Mitchell and without Mike Conley. So that is a huge win for a Jazz team that looked just completely out of sorts and discombobulated against the Timberwolves in that little two-game slide that they had. And they come out tonight and just took all of that frustration out on the Sacramento Kings, which is what I really want to talk about with this video because – the Kings are in such an interesting spot to me as a franchise. Like, I don't know exactly what the future is. Like, for a lot of teams, it's easy to look and be like, oh, okay, once they adjust this, maybe it's, you know, maybe they're going to be trending upwards or, oh, they just need the right coach. Like, you look at the Knicks where they have, you know, this, uh, this talent assembled where just last year we were all making fun of them for – signing so many power forwards and now this year they are a home court team in the playoffs right now with like two weeks left in the season tom thibodeau came in and immediately revamped that team and that was how fast it could happen with the kings though unfortunately i just don't see a move like that and that's why it's so interesting to me so we'll start at the top with luke walton uh it's always really easy to Blame the coach for struggles. Uh, the, the Kings have just been so inconsistent this year. And while injuries can be a part of that, the, the weird structure of the season with all of the travel and all the COVID-19 restrictions and health and safety protocols, sure, sure, you can give them that too. But to have games like this tonight where you lose by 49 points, there just there was no adjustments that he could make, and it seems at times like that team is just done listening to him. The other day they lost a close game, and you know their shot at the buzzer was a Harrison Barnes step back three that was heavily contested. Like Tyrese Halliburton, their rookie this year, has been he had been cutting it up, getting to the bucket whenever he wanted, and the game winning attempt was a Harrison Barnes last ditch effort covered three and you know it's little things like that now a lot of people were high on luke walton when he got the lakers job because he had done so well with the warriors filling in for steve kerr but now it's looking more and more like oh well when you have one of the greatest assemblies of talent available to you it's pretty easy to just let them go i mean steve kerr let Iguodala and a couple players call plays for him in the middle of their big win streak. So the big issue for me with Luke Walton and why I don't think he'll be there past this season, I don't know if he'll be there. I might post this tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out he's been let go. But with two weeks left in the season, I'm guessing they'll let him finish the season out. But the big thing to me is development. And the, the young players – you just don't see the type of development that you want from a coach. So even going back to his time at the Lakers where he, you know, you see the, the future, or how do I say this? You see what the players that he had have become in their new systems. Now, D'Angelo Russell was an all-star. Jordan Clarkson might win sixth man of the year. Julius Randle might be all NBA this year, and he was an all-star. Brandon Ingram was an all-star. Lonzo Ball's probably going to get paid, and he's developed nicely. Josh Hart's become a huge player for the Pelicans whenever he's healthy and can play. Like, you see all these players that have gone on to do better things. Uh, and, you know, that's not all on the coach. Like, some of it will be on, you know, fit, roster construction, things for general, general managers and upper management. But it's a trend that I just I can't ignore. So I look at someone like Marvin Bagley who was all rookie first team his rookie year. The Kings made the mistake, or, you know, if you like Bagley over, like, maybe not a mistake in your eyes, but they took Bagley over Luka, over Trey Young, over a couple others, but mainly over Luka. That's the thing that is going to be held over their heads for basically probably the rest of Luka's career 
Uh, there's rumors now that Bagley might not be with the team next season. He's going to jump up to $11 million in his salary, and they're going to have a decision to make. Do we extend him? Do we trade him? Do we, and with all the injuries he's had and the, the regressions he's shown in those injuries and coming back from those injuries from that all-rookie first-team season, his value is so low. Like The Kings are going to be at a disadvantage trying to make anything happen as far as, you know, trading him he had his issues earlier where his his dad was arguing and, and like twitter beefing with De'Aaron fox's dad who is now a max player the the franchise player currently and it's just been a mess it's been a huge debacle and and distraction and the kings have started they started the season off promising enough they had a little stretch where they seemed to hit a groove and then they've had multiple nine ten game losing streaks just in the last like three months alone, it's a team that it just you don't know what you're getting night to night. And so while I think a lot of that is on the coach, I do also want to put a little bit of it on the former regime. You had Vlade Divac uh, making all of the picks, calling all of the shots, and most of his picks are no longer with the team um, outside of Marvin Bagley, who who knows what his future will be. Um, for the King, like on the plus side though, De'Aaron Fox is absolutely that dude. He has shown unbelievable improvement almost every year. Uh, he's been out the last couple games, I guess due to health and safety, which is a bummer because the flashes he's showing and his ability to make decisions, you know, in speed with how fast he is on the court. Like his speed is obviously an advantage and a mismatch to basically anyone having to defend him. And the fact that he can process and make these decisions in that speed as well just gives him just another level and just another threat to his game, Included, including in that, too, the improved three-point shooting that he's had this year in particular, uh, both catch and shoot and just spot up. He's been a lot better than he started out his career. And so he, as every bit, seemed like the guy for them at point guard. Uh, Tyrese Halliburton this year, their pick, is he's been fantastic, too. I had him as like a dark horse rookie of the year type contender because I thought, you know, the Kings expectations were so low that if he came in and provided a spark and won them some games himself or really contributed meaningfully, I thought it could be his for the taking. And I think he's definitely, you know, maybe not rookie of the year, but I think he's put his name in the conversation more than people would have expected. I think he's shown incredible flashes as a playmaker. He's a smart playmaker. He's a smart defender. He's just one of those dudes that he will take his growing pains, but he knows where he needs to be on the court. Um, Buddy Heald is an interesting one because he's had a huge uh, spat with management. He did get his contract eventually, but like him and Luke Walton have not liked each other since like 2019, 2020. And it was pretty much seeming like it was going to be, okay, one of the two has to go, either him or him or Luke Walton. And somehow they have hung on to him this long. I don't know if that means he's there to stay even if they get rid of Luke Walton or if it means he could be someone that they could try to flip. Uh, going into next season in particular, too, they do have some money coming off of the books. It's mostly, you know, minor, minor expenses. I think the most expensive one was like $6 million. But like Hassan Whiteside, Rashawn Holmes, Mo Harkless and Terrence Davis are all coming off of the books. And Rashawn Holmes has been an important piece for them, uh, especially with Bagley Hurt. Hassan Whiteside, you know, he has his, his flashes, but he definitely has weaknesses in his game that have kind of caused him to bounce around as much as he has in the league. So Rashawn Holmes has been a very important piece for them. And losing him, if they aren't able to re-sign him, is going to put them at an even bigger disadvantage in terms of any future rebuilds. Uh, as for draft picks, too, they do um, have their first this year in this coming draft. They have a couple uh, second-round picks by way of different trades and trying to stockpile assets that way. But the problem is they're, like, not middle of the – so they're 12th in the West right now, and that puts them, compared to everybody else, probably in, like, the range for, like, an 8th, ninth pick depending on how the lottery ends up working with these changed uh, rules and everything. So they might be looking at like a bottom towards the end lottery pick again, where like they got Tyrese at 12, I believe, 
and you know that was a steal that was a great get for them but i just don't know if they're going to be able to keep getting those impact players and it's funny because i grew up hating the kings i grew up as a laker fan as the basketball next to me will probably dictate and i hated the kings i hated vade divak i hated mike bibby hated doug christie i hated everything about them and as i've grown up and I've watched more and more basketball. I've kind of softened on them a bit. There's a couple teams like that that I've just softened my stance on, basically. And the Kings have a lot of players that I really enjoy watching. So I always find myself watching their games. I love uh, Doug Christie as an announcer, which is a twist that I did not see coming at all for myself. But he's he's great. I love the way he breaks down the game. Um, and they've just they've become a team that I can't help but watch a ton of when they're on so it's i see these things and i know how passionate kings fans are like that team was almost gone from the city and they fought and rallied to save it and keep their kings and i think that that's incredible i always see huge turnouts at their games uh they support their guys and it's tough because they currently have i believe the longest playoff drought streak in the league the phoenix suns tonight with their win clinched their first playoff berth in 11 years and the kings have not made the playoffs since the 05 06 season where they lost in the first round to the spurs that's like 15 years without the playoffs and that's brutal it's brutal for a fan base like that that's so passionate about their team that's brutal because they've seen you know Failed rebuild after failed rebuild, and now they're sitting here with a, a stud point guard, a very highly ta- talented and touted rookie. Buddy Heald is great, and they just, for whatever reason, the ingredients are not working together. They're not quite adding up, um, and that's a bummer. It's a bummer for the team. It's a bummer for the fans, and, you know, you don't want to see the team end up at square one again should they decide, you know, okay, well, okay, De'Aaron Fox is a little bit out of our range now, so we should trade him so we can get another young asset back that puts us on our on our timeline. And I just I don't know what they can do. I don't think that there's a coach out there that if they fire Luke Walton, they can just grab and plug in, um, at least to me. I don't see one. I love saying Kenny Atkinson for young teams because what he did with that Nets team I don't think should be ignored. But at the same time, like, he also had a lot of the same issues where it was bad play design in crunch time. His last his last shot attempts that he would draw up, those plays were not usually very good. And so I think it would be, you know, maybe a little more development from players like Halliburton and Bagley. But it would also frustrate players because you would have, you know, his his approach where he likes to ride the hot hand and, you know, just. I guess just general inexperience too in those crunch time type situations. So that's the problem. I don't see an easy fix for them. But after this 49 point loss tonight, I knew I was like, okay, I have to do something. And I didn't want to just rag on Luke Walton for the whole video. Uh, You know, even as a Lakers fan, the man has a couple rings with the team. He is a Lakers. I'm not going to go so far as to say legend. He's a Lakers champion. So I did not want to just be like, here's 15 minutes of me dumping on Luke Walton. Um, I don't know what the team can do. I don't know where <laughs> where the road to up starts. But Kings fans, there are, you know, you've got some of the players. Like, it, w- it will be a slow climb, unfortunately. But I think, you know, in two to three years – couple solid draft picks, maybe if they end up having to flip a Harrison Barnes or a Buddy Heald, um, see what you can get for those guys if you can find a team desperate to add that type of shooting. Um, you know, I just, just stay optimistic, Kings fans. I think that's going to be the, the main message of this video. Uh, hopefully in two weeks you get a clearer idea of the future, uh, get a new head coach in there, maybe, you know, Maybe the draft lottery breaks your way, but I'm sorry that it's come to this where that's all I can <laughs> all I can offer. Uh, if you're a Kings fan or if you have thoughts on who should coach them or what type of moves that they might be able to make, please drop them in the comments because I really can't think of anything outside of uh, draft picks and hitting on those. So let me know in the comments section. 
thank you for watching and i will be back soon